Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Our hot crime summer week continues today with a fascinating episode. Today, we bring you the case of convicted sex offender and pedophile, Jared Fogel. You may remember this guy as Jared from Subway. Subway sandwiches? Jared was a popular spokesman for Subway for 15 years. While the world watched Jared talk about his weight loss and his favorite sandwiches on TV, one woman, Rochelle Herman, was working tirelessly behind the scenes to put Jared behind bars. She knew something the rest of us did not. And this is the story of how she learned it and worked to expose him. Rochelle joins us today to walk us through the Jared Fogel case and to share how she helped take down the now disgraced Subway spokesman. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. In a startling description, the UN food chief warned the world with these words, knocking on famine's door. Say what? He called what we're facing a perfect storm of a perfect storm, and he's not alone. A Barron's report says a food shortage could be coming even in the United States. Farmers see it too. John Boyd Jr., a fourth generation farmer, recently said, quote, we're going to see empty food shelves in the coming months. That's why getting survival food is more important than ever. Create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years, super survival food. Hand-packed in a family-owned facility in the USA and giving jobs to over 200 Americans. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, for the next few days, viewers will get 10% off their first order at for patriots.com. That's the numeral four patriots.com by using the code MK. Go to four patriots.com, use code MK to start your stockpile today. Rochelle Herman, so good, 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 good to have you here. Thank you so much for being on. You're very welcome. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Oh, I'm I'm so awed by what you did, your whole role in this. I've watched the whole series and you are a heroine and it, just an incredibly courageous, ballsy person. I mean, the the number of things you did to advance the case against this guy is a it's a long list and at extraordinary peril to yourself, your family. All right, so we're gonna go through it. And and I I okay. knew this story. I was in news, but I didn't know anything about you, Rochelle, prior to seeing this. So I'm grateful. Um, for this investigation discovery uh, production and to get to know you. All right, so let's start at the beginning. You're down there in Florida. You're minding your own business. You're building your radio show. You're doing well. And that job as a journalist, as a public person, brought you within the orbit of Jared Fogel, the subway guy. For what reason? How? He was working with the American Heart Association for um, talking with children, motivating them because of childhood obesity. So he was a guest on my show um, because I always gave time to, you know, organizations such as the American Heart Association. So you met him and on that first meeting, did he, what did he seem like? Uh, the first time that I met him, um, he was about 20 minutes late, but he saw, he seemed very, um, he, he was very nice. He was very low key, um, very pleasant, and he wanted to help children. That was the whole process for the interview. I think we like to tell ourselves we would be able to tell if we were in the presence of a child predator, just to make ourselves feel better, you know, as moms, as humans. And that's why it is it is important that before you started to spend more time with him, he seemed, quote, normal to you. We can't tell. Mm -hmm. Like, just ask anybody who's in the Catholic Church. You can't tell. No. That's a very important point that you bring up, Megan, is you can't tell. And that's why I worded it the way that I did, because he was very nice, very cordial, polite, and he was really focused on wanting to help children with childhood obesity. So you can't tell who a predator is. Most people have no idea when they're sitting right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, 
in so many instances, they create a job or a situation around them that brings children into their orbit. I mean, it's such a push-pull because they do that. And yet, we all know so many great educators and coaches who are wonderful, who would never hurt a child, who make it their mission to help children as a profession, who we don't want to scoop up into that perverted, sick thing. But it's no accident, right? That it's, it's probably no accident that Jared created this charity having to do with children. No, it's no accident at all. And, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, across the country, if there, I think it's about 80% or more where the predator is known, whether it's family related, but they do happen to know that they're familiar with the child. They are, whether they're friends or, as you had mentioned earlier, um, educators, they could be clergy. I've received a number of messages from people around the world that have been victims. They have fallen victim to being, you know, having sexual abuse as a child through these individuals. And Mm -hmm. they run the whole gamut of who you think would be safe. I should say up front, the FBI does not want you to be doing this interview. Is that true? Yes, but let me please let me clarify. Um, the FBI, I was approached uh, recently, and they they asked me to fall back. And the reason why is for my own safety. It's not because I have brought a voice to what is happening, and I'm giving my voice to help anyone who has been subjected, whether it's Jared's victims or otherwise, to childhood uh, sexual abuse, um, trafficking, whatever, and the. They don't want me to put my life at risk. And apparently I have angered a certain demographic. There's a number of people. I have received some um, emails, messages from individuals, not very many, I would say maybe 2%, um, very angry with what I did. Uh, And and they're in defense of Jared. Uh, Oh, my gosh. Yes. It's really sick, in my opinion. All right, so we'll get to why and all of that, but it's absurd. Thank you for, I mean, again, putting yourself at risk and coming on to tell the story. It is important. It's not just about Jared, though we do need to watch him too because he's getting out of prison in the not too distant future. But there are sadly many, many Jareds out there and Rochelle's become a bit of an expert in how to spot them and how to keep kids safe. So there's a lot baked into your story. All right, so you, that was meeting number one, rather unremarkable. And then tell us about the second time you met him. Uh, well, it was actually shortly after that. Um, I had met him because we did, we were scheduled to do uh, to do radio first. I did radio and TV as a, as a show host. And we did the radio interview first. And then I met him um, at a local, um, a local middle school in Sarasota. And it was then that he said something to me when we were alone um, in the auditorium, we were setting up for the influx of the children to come in and uh, they were all very excited to meet him. And so we were setting up and my cameraman was across the way preparing the cameras and our mics were hot. Jared didn't know that. And he had leaned over to me. He was very flirtatious um, and very friendly and was just, and had general chatting with me. And I asked him if he was excited about meeting the kids. And then he leaned over and he said, just above a whisper, how hot he thought middle school girls were. This is so bizarre. This happened at the beginning of your second meeting? Like he's saying- The same day. That is so, it's so confusing, right? That he mm-hmm. would- right off the top, say something. Do you think it's because he didn't realize how inappropriate that sounded to someone who's normal? I I can only speculate why he said that to me, um, but he was very interested in me and maybe he wanted to say something to me to see whether I would be on board at, or and don't waste his time. But what happens is I kind of, shut down inside when someone says something that inappropriate um i just 
I have a blank expression and I think that is, you know, my reaction to situations of this nature or similar is that I don't lash out. I'm internalizing everything. And I was thinking to myself, did I really just hear what he said? Was that accurate? And I looked across, I glanced to my cameraman and his mouth hit the floor and I could tell, yes, that's exactly what I heard. Mm. Now, most of us, I, I gotta be honest, would have said, so Jared's a freak. My God, what the hell's up with Jared from Subway? And moved mm -hmm. on. I mean, that's truly what most people would have done. Um, like he's a freak, but like there's no evidence that he's more than just a weird freak who thinks about these things. Not you. This is what makes you different. Like the, the people who make a difference on this earth are the people who just go the extra mile, who, who don't just move on. And so while you were thrown, you were, you know, you, know, you said you sort of internalize, mm -hmm. you started to come up with a plan. Well, I did. And, and if, if I may, um, what I did, I thought anybody would do. And I was told down the line um, by one of the agents that I was working with, they told me, Rochelle, what, what you have done um, in the initial steps and everything that I did, most people would not do. And I that was really perplexed by that. I was like, what do you mean most people wouldn't do that? That is the right thing to do. It's a moral and public obligation. And no, apparently most people wouldn't. No. I, and it's usually the instinct is, oh my God, get away, right? Like usually it's like the guy's, mm -hmm. something's off. Get, let me get out of here. But you went the other way. You went in and created a relationship with him that would prove very important and is ultimately one of the reasons why he's behind bars for as long as he is. Um, I want to run a clip from, from the show um, mm -hmm. that sort of takes us a little bit into some of that. It's called Jared from Subway Catching a Monster. And it talk, it's you talking about your decision-making about what to do next, SOT3. Mm -hmm. Noah, I can be completely utterly honest with you about everything. I can't wait to see you. What do you want to do? You. <laughs> I had to play a role with Jared that I was interested in him personally, romantically. This was, in essence, a honey trap. I was going to use his flirting with me, interest in me to my advantage. Absolutely. Why would I not? That was my leverage. I think you're incredible. Well, I think you're amazing, baby. Everything I can imagine in a woman, everything I can imagine in a mate, everything I can imagine in a friend, everything I can imagine in everything. So you got close to him. And this was in the midst of you two getting closer as, quote, friends, but you mm -hmm. were doing it for a reason. I did. And I will tell you, I would lay my life on the line to help protect, especially a child, anyone that, you know, is in need. It's just my natural instinct to dive right in. But it for what I had to do and what I was subjected to hearing is nothing in comparison to what these children go through. It's so disturbing. We, my producer, Natasha, cut a bunch of clips from the show, 80% of which we're not going to run. It's too dark. It's too disturbing. And we talk about dark things sometimes on this show. Too dark, too disturbing. In the context of the film, it's okay. It, it works and you need it to be in there. In the context of this interview, it would be too, too much for people to hear these actually just dark graphic desires of Jared as spoken to you. I mean, you're the reason we have them, but we'll play a couple enough so the audience gets it. But you went through a lot having to hear that. It's like stumbling upon child pornography. Like imagine if you stumbled upon a magazine of child pornography just as you're cleaning your house and, and reading the most vile, discuss that's what you were forced to endure in these conversations with him. It was even worse than that, Megan. Um, the fact is, is that he was telling me what he was doing, what he did, the children's reactions. And one thing that was not, there's a number of things that were not um, revealed, addressed in the docuseries. There's only three hours out of five years, 24-7 um, work that I had 
been able to acquire. Uh, so there, there's more to it, um, of course, but there's, there's a difference when, when what you see in a magazine and a story that you read, then when somebody is telling you what they're doing and the reaction and there, oh he was, he actually defined how he was grooming the children, which ultimately led to the rewriting of the playbook for uh, profiling pedophiles within the FBI. Mm. Right. And the grooming is all over the news, that word these days. And I mm-hmm. confess it was looming large in my own mind as I watched the docuseries because you hear some of it in his exchanges with you, what he wants you to do to help get children, you know, in his mind, ready for to visit him. Of course, this would never happen. And you were, of course, working with the FBI. But it is. it was illuminating. And I think we can draw some lessons from it. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to lay the foundation first. So you decide to start befriending him. But as you point out, it's more of a honeypot operation. Like lure him in. He was obviously mm-hmm. attracted to you. And um, get him to start talking. Get him to say more about the hot middle schoolers. But you didn't know whether he would. I mean, it's tough to know whether that was a passing comment. He's just a weird guy or this is an actual pedophile and he's going to actually confess it to me, a public figure. So how confident were you that you could get him to do that? Uh, Well, I wasn't very, it wasn't about confidence, to be honest with you. It was just about strategy, uh, what to say, how to say it. But really what he was saying to me wasn't what he wanted to do. He described in in such detail what he did and the responses from the children, their reactions, what they would say, um, how to be able to uh, really wade through and find the the right specific child, which was typically from a you know from a broken family, um, possibly have some kind of. Um, uh, you know, uh, mental health issues, um, depression, or or otherwise. I mean, he wanted the weak to prey on. Mm. You start just using your dictaphone. Been there, sister. Mm-hmm. I was that person too many years ago <laughs> right. before we had the iPhone. I was a lawyer yeah. back then. But yeah, you started to tape him using a dictaphone. And the vast majority of your relationship was over the phone, right? Like, where was home it, base for him? You're, you were in Florida, and he was where? Well, his home is in Indianapolis, or yeah, was, was okay. in Indianapolis. Um, so that's his home base. And that, But he traveled so much. I mean, majority of the time, he was always on the road. And not just in the United States, he was abroad um, in a number of other countries. And he would be on the phone with me, and I would be on the other on the other end of the phone and I could hear the crowds and the excitement. Oh, you're the subway guy. Um, the kids screaming. He said to me once that he was as popular as Michael Jackson in Australia. You know, what's crazy. The docuseries does a good job of showing that he really was. I, I lived it. I was a human on this earth at the time. Everyone knew him. I knew him, but he was hugely popular. It was beyond your normal, oh, there's that guy from the ad. He became just ubiquitous. He was everywhere. He was Subway. He was in every ad. I mean, like, was it 300 ads for Subway? Yes, I believe so. He was just an everyday, ordinary guy. And people really supported him because of his quick rise to stardom and for losing weight and, you know, doing his diet Uh, with specific sandwiches from Subway. So it was like, you know, for the average person, for anyone really, looking at him, he was just like an all-American hero because of how he reached, you know, that level of stardom. Mm. And then the, the, the movie points out, he made millions. I mean, he became very rich, very famous, well-traveled, beloved, with a lot of access to power players. So all of this happened over the course of some 15 years. And I think that's about the, the span, mm-hmm. all based on that one article in his um, University of Indiana, where he was going to school and lost 245 pounds in a year by eating two Subway sandwiches a day. 
and they did an article on him. Subway heard about it, made him their spokesperson, and boom, off to the races. So you're in the midst of this phone relationship with him, and he is starting to say incriminating things. So the first time, this was something that was unclear to me from watching the series. He made the comment about the middle schoolers. Then you're on the phone with him, and you can hear in that last clip I played how it's getting kind of sexy between the two of you. But then, and you were clearly in some of the clips trying to push it to like, so on the kids subject, because you were on a mission, Mm -hmm. how hard was it to extract the admissions that you would ultimately get from him uh, in that that that, phone relationship? It was interesting because it, it was a phone relationship because I was never allowed during the time that I enlisted with the FBI to meet with him in person, although I wanted to because I felt as though that the case could move, you know, much more swiftly and I could gain, you know, uh, deeper information, um, more hands on, if you will. And he it it was to me baffling that somebody would entrust another person with a phone conversation as a relationship and Mm. share in detail everything that he did. When I think about it, I'm thinking perhaps he was lonely, didn't have, um, because he was so busy with his schedule at Subway. He really didn't have time to make friends. And he was, he had his friends, but not being all over the world, anyone that he could trust like that. So perhaps it was just something that a necessity for him. Mm, so maybe easier than you expected at first. Now, wait, mm-hmm. before you brought in the FBI, I love how you're 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 moving the pieces. But before that, you did have one meeting with him and it was yes, scary, right? Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, he said he was coming into Palm Beach and uh, he was going to be there for a couple of days. He had to do some work with Subway and asked if I would come up. And you know, here I am based out of Sarasota and I really wanted to get this information. So I did, I agreed to, and he told me where he was. And that's when I took the drive and I went there and, um, he opened the door, welcomed me in. Um, hi, how are you doing? Um, and then almost immediately became very flirtatious and hands-on and I kept pushing him aside and just trying to continue with the conversation because I had my dictaphone in my handbag and it was recording. So I wanted to get as much information as quickly as possible. So I was very uncomfortable being there. And it wound up in you fleeing, right? Like he, yes. he left the room and you, you fled, which must've been very, he, you must've been very scared to just kind of jeopardize your operation by just piecing out. I, I was, I will tell you, I, I replay that time over and over in my head. And I was so grateful when he did excuse himself um, from the room for a few minutes, because that was my opportunity. Other than that, I don't know how I would have gotten away because I don't, I'm not sure he would have let me. And you think back now, think of all he had to lose. What if he had found your dictaphone? What if your purse had spilled? Well, that was definitely top of mind, but I will say I raced to my car as soon as he, as soon as that door shut, I I quickly and very quietly exited and raced to my vehicle. And then the entire drive home, uh, which is about three hours, I was crying. I was so upset um, because of what I just put myself at risk of, but I still needed more information. I was very disappointed that I didn't get anything um, concrete. It was inaudible, but there had to be another way. And I knew that that he was interested enough that that another opportunity would arise. You just told me you had a phone call from your kids and you had to get out of there when he called to say, hey, where'd you go? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's interesting to me, just from a human perspective and watching your story is you talk about how you cried on the way home. And there's another point in, at which you admit you threw up after one phone call. And just, you're very open about how this was actually really, really difficult on you emotionally. And I have to say, Rochelle, I like that. It, it's it's almost a more interesting story because you are very vulnerable in that way. You're not this 
you know, tough as nails, like I was going to nail him and I got him and it was, you know, screw him. You were very fragile at, at times in this thing, but you kept at it. That is such a hopeful story, I think, to everyone out there. And even if you are a crier, even if you're emotional, even if it's really hard, if you keep at it, whatever it may be, you could accomplish something hugely important. You, you certainly can. Now, I would like to point out, Megan, if you don't mind, that yeah. this really tore me apart. It was very emotionally draining, psychologically. It was, it, it was just a disaster um, because of everything that I heard. I, I do not want, in my mind, to share with other people. And that's why it took me quite a while um, before I came out to, to even share even a, a portion of what had transpired. Um, but, and I, and I thought after the docuseries was aired, uh, it would make me stronger. And it did, but it was a grueling two years piecing this together. And after the airing, um, and I can't, can't go into detail um, too much, but um, there was an attack on on family member of mine. And that is what made me very strong. I'm uh, I'm different now than I was when after, you know before that happened, and that's only been mm. a couple of months. But yeah. it just put everything into perspective for me in the sense that you know you're you have to stand up and and do what is right because these it's not it's not something that anybody should stand down it's something that i believe everyone if you can make a serious difference if you make an effort to stand up and do what's right mm. that's crazy i didn't realize there was a contingent of jared defenders out there how is this even remotely controversial for what you did or what he's been exposed for? I don't know. There, there was a couple that I read. Um, they felt as though my recording him was illegal, which actually there was a gray area. So, and, and the FBI knew that because that's what I shared with them. It's a public broadcasting entity. He knew that I was a known talk show host. He called into the same telephone number, the same studio line. He knew it was the studio number. There was no expectation what? of privacy. Exactly. I didn't realize that. Wait, these are mm-hmm. these phone calls are on your studio line? The initial ones before I d- agreed to work with the FBI, before I presented the case to the FBI, that. I recorded everything within the studio. He's a lunatic. I mean, <laughs> talk about risky Okay, so you get these tapes and he does start saying very inappropriate and incriminating things. And you go to the FBI. And I mean, as soon as they hear what you have, they've got four agents in the room with you. It's like, you know, Absolutely. I'm sure that at first they were like, some lady from Sarasota's here. She's clean. But then it becomes very real, very fast. And mm-hmm. they and you become a confidential informant for the FBI. You start working with them. You start, what, was it wearing wires or how would you work yes. with the FBI on the, oh, the I phone had, calls? Yes, 24-7. Um, you know, I had, I there there is protocol for when you make an outgoing call, if I were to call him, and when you receive, and from, you know, beginning to end, different things you need to say, just for legalities. And also, once I had those tapes, once I had that recording, you I needed to bring them and do a drop immediately um, for the integrity of the the information. It's like something out of a movie. You're going to like the dark parking yes. lot, doing the quick drive by, you know, handoff. And they say that's for your own safety. So nobody, what? if he were watching you, you know, he wouldn't see anything. Well, that's exactly right. That's why they do it in, you know, the darker corners. They'll do it at, you know, under night, um, you know, in alleyways. And they do it where they pull up alongside me. And it's always the dark, you know, the black suburbans, very dark tint. You do the handoff. It it, it was really very surreal, very creepy. Um, I wanted to have further conversation with the agents when I made drops at certain times. But they did. They could not. They did not do that. And I found out later on the reason why was because they, they did not want to chance anyone seeing this transpiring. Because it would mm. put me at risk. See, as a CI, 
CIs, you're given aliases and numbers, and that's what you're referred to, not your real name. But I came out when Jared was arrested, and I shared because the public has a right to know, and that is exactly why I'm here today. And there's further information that I'd like to share, and I have a lot of things, you know, that I'm going to, that I am pursuing um, because I think that I can make a big difference. But with the help of others, you know, out there, you know, mostly the victims, because without their stories, you know, they can really share some insight that we don't have personally if we haven't gone through it. Well, you added a piece to it that was very important, which was it's one thing for the FBI to be saying we found thousands of images of child pornography on his computer in his hard drive. It is another for us to hear it in his own words, his sick Mm -hmm. perversions. There's just no getting around that. One thing you can compartmentalize a little bit more easily, like, oh God, who knows what was on there? I guess he's a sick dude. But to hear him, again, we won't be playing the most graphic sound bites here, Mm -hmm. is a different story. You just, you know, and you feel very motivated to keep him behind bars forever, ideally. But right now that we're not on track for that. So you're working with the FBI. How long did that period go on, you and the FBI? Actively, um, just under five years. So this is a great frustration to us and to you. The audience mm-hmm. now is saying, five years? What do you mean? He's, mm-hmm. he's making these admissions. He, in, in the docuseries, they, you hear him talking about allegedly going to Thailand and what he did to the little children over there who were being sex trafficked. Um, why wouldn't they go arrest him? What not that enough to get a search warrant to see if he does have child pornography? Like, why? And what was the FBI saying? Well, one would think. Um, I was very frustrated because I had given thousands of recordings um, over the years, and they were so compelling. I even made phone calls to the office out of Tampa, middle of the night, um, you know, in trying to track down my handlers, my lead agent, uh, to let them know that Jared is boarding a plane. He's going, uh, he's, you know, it's going to this city. And he told me he's, you know, this one particular incident, there was a little girl he was going to see. And he alluded to the fact that the parents knew what he was going to do. So there's more to the story than just that, but that is what he had told me. And I had that all on tape and I couldn't understand um, why it was so difficult, you know, working together with other law enforcement agencies to follow him, you know, when he gets, when he gets off the air, the airplane and just track him to where he's going to track his cell phone, uh, something. And I, I still, I don't understand all the inner workings. They have their reasons, but um, I found that to be very frustrating uh, because I didn't know what else to do. I know many of you make money freelancing or running a solo small business. You probably love the flexibility and control, but you hate the crushing busy work. Well, you could hire a bunch of different people like a CPA, a bookkeeper, even an attorney, and end up paying thousands of dollars a month. Or you could use Collective. Collective is an all-in-one financial solution for freelancers, contractors, and self-employed entrepreneurs. Collective handles all of your corporate formation and compliance paperwork, your taxes, your bookkeeping, accounting, even payroll. If you've already made money this year, but you don't have an S-Corp election, right now through June 30th, Collective can save you thousands on your taxes in 2023 because they are able to backdate your S-Corp election to Jan 1. In fact, Collective members save on average 10,000 bucks a year per year on their taxes. Act before June 30th to save potentially thousands of dollars in 2023 taxes. Go to collective.com to save on taxes this year and have someone who knows what they're doing handle your setup, accounting, bookkeeping, and taxes, even your personal taxes. That's collective.com and tell them Megan sent you. We're going to play two sound bites here of your discussions with him. And this is where it took just a particularly dark turn for, for poor you, because you, you're a mom and you had two young kids who are, I think nine and 10. I mean, it was a period of years, so they were aging, but right. they were around there. And Jared knew that. And he started to turn the discussion to your own 
children, which is something very different than the abstract idea, which is awful enough. Mm -hmm. Um, So we've got a bit of that from the piece. We'll play Sot 4 first. And this is a viewer warning. This is disturbing um, and not appropriate for children. Will you do anything I tell you to do? Yes, I will. You promise? Yes. Will you let me see your kid naked? Oh my God, Rochelle, that is stomach turning. It, it really is. For all those, your composure. Well, for all those years prior, uh, he really did not bring my children into conversation at all. So now his sights were set on my kids. How did you manage through that? Actually, when that initially happened and he started to zone in on my kids and ask questions, that's when I spoke with my lead agent, um, Billings, Special Agent Billings, and she, I, I was going to quit and just walk away. And through conversations, they did not have anybody else to get in. They, they, they had tried for quite a while um, through me to try to introduce an agent to take my place ultimately, but he would never bite. He was just, he was just very um, stuck on wanting to talk with me. You were it for the FBI, mm-hmm. for everyone. Here's a second sound bite, yeah. same vein and same warnings. Describe the kids for me. Girl who died. So what's your kids? Do you think I like better seeing naked? Your son or your daughter? Um, I don't know. You seem to like both girls and boys. Oh, oh. Yeah. Which one would you think I would like better? I don't know. I really don't. don't know. Know. Oh my god. That was the very FBI, difficult for me to hear. Of course, my god, your strength is superhuman. The FBI. They just weren't doing it. And you ultimately did something extraordinary. Again, another extraordinary act. You went to, was it the local DA to try to get somebody to do something? I went to local law enforcement, Sarasota Police Department. Uh, I I had my own talk shows, TV, radio, great following. Um, did it not locally, just not only locally, but nationally as well on a number of different um, venues. And I was going to and played it out in my mind many times because I felt that the F, that they there was so much information that I had already shared. I know what he's doing. They know what he's doing, um, and every minute makes a difference. That's a that's a potential child being violated, being stopped, right. um, it, you know, being harmed, and that is something that I wasn't going to stand down any longer. So I went to. Sarasota Police Department and essentially turned in the FBI. And of course, you can only imagine the looks that I got and they were questioning, what did you just say? What are you doing? (laughs) And you're reporting why? And I said, because, you know, it's, I felt as though that they were putting the public at risk for um, not moving quicker in the case. But yeah. I am not, it was great teamwork and I, I applaud and commend all of the law enforcement worldwide that really participated in this um, Interpol and because there were so many different countries that were involved, um, but they wouldn't allow me to leave. I went on my lunch break and um, I was there for many hours and they had tied in, um, there was probably about 30 or 40 um, law enforcement, um, and then all of a sudden the FBI, a bunch of agents walk in the door, and I felt as though I was almost being, you know, quashed not to say anything through intimidation. But I, I stood my ground, and it took them quite a while before they convinced me not to go public. They did say that I would be impeding um, an ongoing investigation, and there would be repercussions legally against me and uh and i still did it didn't i didn't care and they saw that and it finally took uh one of the detectives from sarasota 
police department that pulled me aside. And only by what he shared with me did I agree not to go public because having my own um, airtime, I wanted to lock the door and then broadcast what what I had been doing, what I had discovered, and just warn the public myself. Um, it's the last resort. But, right. And and he told me, this, this um, detective, he said that what they discovered, because they couldn't tell me all the details, and they and I understand that, but they said, he said to me, what they discovered was that Jared was but a pea in a pod, regardless of how big he was, um, so well known, that he was leading them to even larger individuals, political figures, celebrities, um, and that a case like this typically takes at least 10 years, if not longer, to get the concrete information. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it will happen, he will be taken, taken down, but it's gonna take that time and process. But in the meanwhile, when that does happen, he told me that I would see these others fall uh, from grace, really, and um, be exposed for what was really going mm -hmm. on. And that leads me to believe Jared pled guilty. I was so grateful that the children and even myself didn't have to go to trial and put anybody else at risk of having to go through that whole ordeal because that's traumatizing again to these children. Um, so I just, I just wonder, you know, I don't know whatever has been redacted from the reports, um, what he did to steer them in this direction, or if it was only through their own investigative um, resources of how they found out. But, you know, now we see Epstein, you know, uh, he had fallen shortly thereafter, really, in the grand scheme of things, it was only a few years. But you know, and I can't see why he would not have at some point engaged with Epstein because he he liked going to Boca Raton. He liked going to Palm Beach and spending time there. And, you know, Palm Beach is where where Epstein lived. And that's where his playground was for the most part, aside from his island, of course. But um, so I think there's a lot more to it. And I think a lot more is going to come out. Wow, I hadn't even considered the Epstein connection because I was going to say there was no domino cascade of celebrities and public figures falling mm -hmm. for this kind of thing after Jared. Epstein would be a big one that if there were mm -hmm. if there were a connection there that would be a very significant one. The, how long in advance of Jared's arrest did that conversation with you happen where they said all that and urged you not to go oh. on your show and mm -hmm. tell? three, four years, maybe could have been longer, wow. but, but I had, I had been working with them, I think for about three years. And, and that's when I went to Sarasota police to turn them in to hopefully, you know, ramp up the operation, uh, and put new, you know, maybe some new eyes on the case. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was, with a few years after after that, because I had a couple more years in, and you know that was that that's just how all that transpired. So you are you're going through this. There's it's very difficult for you now. Were you a single mom? I couldn't tell whether you had a divorce or yes. Okay. Yeah, we we were we were separated. Obviously, first it's um, and then um, ultimately divorced. So I was a single mom raising mm. my children, but we had 50, 50 custody. Um, and it's interesting. My, um, my ex-husband, my children's father, uh, was retired police department from Sarasota. Um, and aside from our differences that anyone would have going through a divorce and being divorcees, um, most people don't get along right away. That takes years to develop, but he removed that aspect of our personal life and he was all hands in, all hands on deck, helping me watch the children, taking them last minute, doing whatever he could to provide me the time and the understanding because I would be able to talk to him during these times of duress because I told him what I was doing. I would mm -hmm. never do that 
without telling their dad because he had a right to know. And it was important that he did know. But I, I have to give him a lot of credit because he did what I think is very difficult for most people is to put your differences aside and move forward because he knew what I was doing was very important and yeah. risky at that. Your, your son, uh, Thomas, is featured in the docuseries and mm -hmm. appears very proud of what you did. We pulled just one soundbite, but there are a few that we could have chosen from. Um, it's Sod 8. I'm very proud of my mother. She did do something heroic and she, it was selfless because she lost a lot in the process. Your daughter does not appear and there's speculation in the wake of this docuseries that the two of you are estranged, perhaps because of these phone calls, perhaps she held them against you or something else against you. What's the truth on that? The truth on that is she was not... Um, She's a very private person. She was all for us doing the docuseries. She thinks it's important, but she just, you know, personally, she doesn't like, like, you know, all the attention. She doesn't like that. She does, she's very private and tries to keep to herself. Um, but as far as being estranged from her, of course, you know, there was a certain period of time that she was upset with me. She was angry with, um, certain situations because of what she would, you know, perhaps read. And she thinks that I put the, put them at risk, which I never did. And I never would. Um, I did. I, I have been able to just share with her exactly through facts, um, factual information, um, uh, exactly how everything transpired. And she sees that now. But um, what she was most angry with me about was that she lost her mom for all those years. She didn't have the mom connection throughout her childhood for the most part that other kids did because I always had to be away. I could never tell her why. And still to this day, I think that there's some, you know, animosity there because I didn't have to do that with the kids is what she had said when she was younger. She's an adult now, so she thinks differently, but, um, but I, she, her, her whole idea was you didn't have to do that. You needed to spend more time with us. And I get that, but I had, it was a, it was a lose, lose situation in a sense because I lost my ability to be the mom that I always wanted to be. This and was that time consuming? Lost like people mom. out there might be thinking, well, you just had some phone calls every once in a while, a couple of tape mm -hmm. drops. Like what what was so time consuming about it? Well, I was a single mom. I had to make a living. I did my own shows. Um, I booked, I did everything. So it's, you know, that alone, and especially even back then, it's really a two income family. So that took a lot. I did not get compensated during my time with the FBI for all those years. And I would have to leave my house, hire sitters um, if my, you know, if their dad wasn't available. Um, and it was just, it was so time consuming because a, he would call during the day, but a lot of the calls would come in the evening. Being around the world, he'd be in different time zones as well. And they would be relentless. He would call continuously. And I had to go through the taping. And then as soon as they were done, go meet up with an agent and make the drop. And I really was not getting the sleep that I needed. And it was just very draining on me. Um, how many phone calls would you hours, say there, there were over all those years? How many phone calls would you say you, you had taped? Oh, well, if you average it out, at the eight to 10 per day for oh all my those gosh. years. Bear, Seriously? Only towards the very end did they become less and less because he kept wanting to see me in person and they would not allow that. And that wasn't he married really with kids by that time? What at the end Pardon there, Rochelle? What didn't he get married and have uh, have children of his own? Like at the, at the end? I believe so, but I don't think that I was working with the FBI at that point. Okay, so there was a period where your phone calls ended and then there was a gap mm -hmm. and then the arrest. That's correct. Okay, because the weir weirdly, the arrest did not happen as a direct result, as I understand it, of your tapings, though they would become relevant at trial. He mm -hmm. 
had a guy running his children's foundation who was also a disgusting pervert, as it would turn out. And that guy, uh, his name was Russell. What's his What's his last name? Russell Taylor. Russell Taylor. Russell. Uh, mm-hmm. That guy, Russell Taylor, would be the reason Jared would ultimately get caught because he um, had, and without getting too graphic, but he and his wife were into some very disturbing things. And there was a, an email that got circulated of his wife in some sort of very twisted sex act. And the act itself is unlawful. And they got wind of the fact that Russell was emailing it. Emailing the pictures is not unlawful, but they just decided it's time to investigate Russell and his family situation, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And that led them to Russell's computer, which had all these sexual images of children on it, including his own stepdaughters, who we now know whose images we believe were funneled to Jared Fogel. And the young women who are very young moms, at least one of them is a mom herself now, spoke at length in the documentary. Some people take CBD for better sleep or less stress or more calm. Some take it for pain relief, better energy, or better focus and concentration. Today, I want to tell you about CB Distillery, and there are over 2 million satisfied customers. According to a poll of their customers, 90% reported they do sleep better with CBD. 81% say CBD helps with stress, and 80% say CBD helps with aches and pains after physical activity. If you struggle to get a good night's sleep, if you're dealing with too much stress and you could use a little calm in your life, if you suffer with pain and discomfort, especially after physical exercise, you could give CBD a try from cbdistillery.com. Use my 20% discount by visiting cbdistillery.com and enter my initials MK for your discount. No prescription required. That's cbdistillery.com, promo code MK for 20% off, cbdistillery.com. They were very put together, I have to say, for girls who have been through. This guy was taping Mm -hmm. them in their showers, in their beds. It's their stepfather. Put cameras all over their home. Mm -hmm this sick, perverted, mm. and then using the tapes to, I don't know if he sold them. He, he certainly provided them to Jared for people to get off on the images of his own stepdaughters who, who had no idea he was this way, who, who thought that he loved them. Here's um, a little bit of, from Christian and Hannah, the two daughters who spoke out in the documentary. After Russell was arrested, we had to talk to the FBI. I was in a very traumatic frozen state. I couldn't even believe what was happening to me. They sat me down and told me that there were cameras all throughout the house. They were everywhere. Russell, he was watching us in the shower, watching us get dressed in our rooms, watching us masturbate. We were being watched 24 seven. My God. So this leads the police to Jared because they saw Russell had it. Mm -hmm. Russell had given some to Jared. And then they went to Jared. They got a a search warrant for Jared's computers. And then they had him. I mean, they had all the Mm -hmm. images. God only knows what was on his computers. And by that point, Rochelle, he, he was definitely married and they had children. He had It's just terrifying to think that a pedophile can not only molest children, he can make children of his own. And God knows what their future would have been had he not been caught. Um, It was a huge deal. We have video of the raid when the police got to his house Mm -hmm. and it hit the news like that, that Jared Fogle, the subway guy, has been arrested. His his home has been raided. Here's the video back at, at that time of him coming out of the house. And no one could believe it. No one could believe that this guy who'd been in our living rooms for 15 years as this sweet guy next door was a sick child molester. So now the day that that happened, you were no longer working with the FBI, but you are the person who's put all these years. What was that like for you? Uh, it was very surreal. Um, I I thought that I would have received a phone call to you know, prep me and let me know. 
Um, I knew while I was working undercover, that was always um, the plan. If, if they had decided that this is the time they were going to arrest him, um, the plan of action was they were going to send um, agents to my children's school. The children had to be prepped if this day were to happen, you know, that and, and the schools, all the, you know, the, the teachers um, and the superintendent, they all needed to be made aware of this over the years. And they had switched yeah. schools um, from time to time um, as they were growing up. And, you know, so they were my kids knew that there was something that was happening. They, um, my son had revealed to me that they, they knew that I was working with the FBI. There was a bad man I was helping them get, but he said to me, he never knew who this person was. And he was actually saying, but he and my daughter, cause they'd have conversations and it was worse that they didn't know who it was because they didn't trust anyone. Um, mm. they didn't know, Honestly, could it be someone that they know, a friend, a family member, somebody at school? Um, I didn't know all these years that that was what they were subjected to. Um, so that really, you know, that that yeah. is difficult and, um, you know, really stomach turning to me to hear what they had to go through. Because um, yeah, everyone's the mentally. boogeyman. Mm -hmm. Everyone's the boogeyman when you don't know. But of course, you weren't at liberty to share any of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so he had two children at the time he was arrested. They were three and five, a boy and a girl. And his wife left him immediately. She had no mm -hmm. idea. That was pretty clear from her public statements. She was right. very angry uh, at him and devastated, devastated. I cannot imagine finding out this person who you love and are building a family with is a monster. I mean, a true monster. It's just... Mm -hmm. This poor woman must have had to go through years of therapy and make sure her children were okay. So at the trial, well, there wasn't a trial, but he got arrested mm -hmm. and he winds mm -hmm. up pleading guilty. But then we get to the sentencing and the judge, though the judge did not give Jared the time you or I would have liked, which could have been up to 50 mm -hmm. years. The judge right. did saddle him with more than the prosecution even recommended and my understanding, Rochelle, is that that was in part due to your tapes and hearing mm -hmm. the years of his admissions on them. Yes, that that's exactly what I had been told. And um, that really gave me, a, you know, a gratifying feeling that those were not wasted years. It was very right. disappointing when I separated because I wasn't able to get an agent in. He just wouldn't, he, he wouldn't bite no matter what I said. And believe me, you know, we put forth great effort trying to get somebody else to take my place because it did ultimately take a toll on me, but I was willing to move forward, but it just, you know, I couldn't move, move forward anymore um, after he started engaging with my children. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and honestly, at that point, I'm sure your faith in the FBI's actually making an arrest was waning. It's like, how many years of this are, am I going to have to go through? It's going to be my whole life. It's going to be my children's whole life. You did your part. Right. You definitely did your part. So he, he cops this plea. He's in prison now till 2029. I mean, it's 2023. Mm -hmm. That's six years away. He's still going to be a relatively young man. And now he knows. He, he knows now about you. He knows it wasn't a friendship that you were taping him. So that's got to be scary for you. Um, it, well, it is. Uh, in a sense, it is because I've had all these years. He has enough money. If he wanted to do something, he could have um, easily hired someone. Um, you see that all the time. Um, my, I, will, I will share with you, my daughter had said to me, um, and I thought that she was, you know, a little, you know, overreacting. But she said to me years ago, she was terrified of Jared with his money. Either he himself would do this or um, when he gets out of prison, that she felt as though he would rape and murder her and her brother. And I said, no. I said, why would you think that? And she said, um, well, you essentially took his, took his children away from him. Why would he not do the same to you? And so I posed that to the agent that I was working with, and the response really took me back. She said, um, 
she's not far off. Oh. And that was the end of it. And I still to this day, it's still very disturbing, but it legitimized my daughter's feelings that she wasn't, she wasn't far off. So it, it, there's a lot of twists and turns that people don't realize that, um, you know, that are still in the shadows that we deal with every day. Forgive me for this question, but I should just ask you for the record. You never did provide any images or access to your children to Jared. Oh, oh no, yeah. no, not at all. And when I said um, moments ago about his, my leaving, you know, cause I couldn't take his engaging with my children. That is through referencing his mentioning yeah. of my children because I never brought them up and I never gave any accurate names of their friends. I made up every name I ever used referring to a child because one day I knew he would be in court. And in hindsight, that those names being um, in line with a child that I was referencing, but really didn't have anything to do, they would end up have been, been subjected to going on the stand, being interviewed to make sure everything, uh, you know, was okay that they weren't involved. So I made everything up um, from mm. the names to everything so Good. that that would never take place. He's 45 now. I guess he'll get mm -hmm. out at age 51. That's still a relatively young man. You don't grow mm -hmm. out of pedophilia. It does. It's a, it's a lifelong affliction. This is why so many people are like, well, how, how does he get out? Like, how do we keep him in? How do we make sure he doesn't hurt more what? children when he, like, what reason do we have to believe he's not going to just pick back up where he left off when he gets out? First, he he has no remorse. He never did. And any of his comments, any of the articles that you read, anyone that he speaks to, he's only remorseful because he got caught. And he's saying, oh, I made a big mistake. Big mistake. He never talks about what he did was wrong. He never no, talks about how sorry he feels for his victims. Never. Every... Every single person from statistically speaking that that um, commits a sexual crime sec that in their lifetime, they end up committing one hundred and seventy nine on average uh, sexual crimes. And mm -hmm. I think he's well over that quota. But when he gets out, he will have a lifetime of supervision until what some something falls through the cracks. I don't know. So my he hope should be chemically is, castrated. There should be a mandatory absolutely. chemical castration. Yep, absolutely. Well, I'll become a lobbyist and be right there to you know try to help move that along because I I do believe that somebody, especially like him, needs that. Um, if the FBI were to release some of these recordings that you have never heard, you've not heard, you that would undoubtedly be right there on the docket. Oh, really? Too. Um, to go through. There's Congress. worse than it's in than is in the docu series. Oh yes, yes. You have to oh, understand. God. I gave all of the recordings. It was only these recordings. I didn't save every recording. You know, initially I was just giving them everything, and then oh. I the reason why I have those recordings was for my own protection because I didn't want anything to be used against me and oh. be thrown in as though, you know, collateral damage because they couldn't make a case. And then all of a sudden, even though I didn't do anything, you know, use these tapes again, you know, against me for any reason. I, there was nothing that indicated they would do that, but I'm one that thinks ahead. So I had I'd made copies of those tapes for myself and I had smart. every legal right to do so. They just didn't know that I made those copies. Oh, wow. Smart. So there's okay. I didn't realize that, and and that was also probably played for the judge. The most the most graphic mm -hmm. pieces of evidence. Possibly, yes. We don't know. Yes, no, we don't know, and I think there's a lot that's redacted. I think, um, you know, these higher ups, these individuals in society, you know, as I said earlier, political to Hollywood celebrities, who knows around the world. Um, that also were friendly with Jared or that would talk maybe online and share ideas and 
and children even, because at one point, and this is just before I turned everything over to the FBI, Jared wanted me to meet him in Chicago. He wanted to, as he said, get a couple of kids. And he talked about underground um, clubs. He knew where to he knew where to go. And that's when I was asking him, well, how would we get these kids? Where would we find them? Oh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll figure it out. So I knew just the way he was saying it and, and leading towards it. He's done this before. He knows what he's doing. The FBI had told me that a pedophile has different um, fetishes, if you will. So they're A, B, and C. Jared is truly an anomaly, something they've never seen before. He is the entire alphabet. So oh, that wow. is what prompted them in their review and rewriting of how to profile pedophiles. Can Do you know whether, I know on the phone, that recordings we heard in the film, mm-hmm. he's saying he went to Thailand and he's pretty explicit about what he allegedly did over there. But then the docuseries mm-hmm. also says that as far as we know, they couldn't find any evidence that he actually did go to Thailand. Well, that struck me as odd because that you just look at his passport to find out whether he went to Thailand. And that's that's knowable. So do, do we know whether that was true? And do we know he whether went, there were actual children victims? I, as a, I mean, as a, of course, the victims in the photos were, were victims. But I mean, you know, that he laid hands on children, actual children. Is... Is there evidence that I do not know? I know what he told me. I know for detail. You cannot make that up. I mean, there's too many minute details, reactions, conversations he's had. Um, even with this one particular boy, his parents, that this is what they do. This is how they make a living. They don't have a problem with it. Talking about the child. They want to do this, he would tell me. They want to. And there is proof that he went to Thailand because there are other production companies that are doing documentaries, or they were because I was scouted by a number of them over the years. And they had called upon me because of my my work. Um, And there are cases he went to Thailand. He went to, to Asia, different areas around the world. And he would go with the founder of subway he would go with some of the vendors from subway um as a group so whether they were uh conducting business or it was a pleasure trip that i do not know but there is actual evidence and proof that they did go i don't know if that's been halted or what or these docus these documentaries will come out here in short order but they've been working on them for the past two or three years You mentioned Subway. I mean, we haven't even really touched on that piece of it. It's, it's it's miraculous to me that this brand withstood this controversy, that the face of the brand turned out to be a serial pedophile. There's no other kind. Mm -hmm. And they're fine. They did fine. There was a question about whether they knew or had reason to know that Jared had this issue with children. The docuseries touches on it a bit. His wife seemed to think that Subway had been given a heads up on at least one complaint about inappropriate behavior towards children. Subway denied that. But what do we know about Subway's knowledge, if any? I know for a fact Subway knows. I wrote them an email during one of my uh, breaks, if you will, I had an emotional break one night. Um, I remember being curled up on the couch um, and crying because of what I had just heard. And I said, if that's enough, I wrote an email to Subway. I went on their corporate website. And once you hit submit, it's, it's, uh, you don't get a copy because it wasn't through your own email feed. So I sent it to them and I told them that Jared was, um, you know, was a sex offender, that he had made comments um, about my children um, and that I know that he's doing these things. I forget verbatim exactly what I said. I do have notes um, in one of my journals that I could reference. But for a long time, Subway said, oh, we never never received that. Well, 
a forensic, in, you know, investigation revealed otherwise from by a third party. And then finally, Subway stood up. Oh, we did find that email, but it didn't say anything about sexual nature. Well, why would I write to Subway otherwise to tell them I like their sandwiches? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so they did. And that was um, written in one of the articles. I do have a copy of that, but it, I'm sure that it can be be found it easily online um, if you look. But, you know, it's it's very interesting. I've had some people approach me, um, you know, through through Messenger or, or whatnot. And, you know, a couple individuals, it was maybe three or four, they thought I did this for the money. Well, I never got paid for my time doing money. this. And somebody, one person had read, oh, you did this. You, you, I bet you already are writing your book to make all this money. Well, you know, that's a very small-minded person in my opinion because if I wanted to make money and that was the way I was going to do it, something so, you know, I don't even have a word to put to that, but why not go to Subway and, you know, ask, tell them, you know, well, I have information and I'm willing to settle out. Or that's a good point. I'm Jared. about to destroy it's not your about brand. Money. It is absolutely yeah. a never Or Jared. Jared was a rich man. You could have gone to him. Yes, of course. And that's very clear if you watch the arc of this story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not, but you should write a book because people need to know. I mean, this is a fascinating story mm -hmm. and there's a lot to be learned. And that, that leads me to my next point we mentioned at the beginning. Okay the grooming behavior. Mm -hmm. So he would say, you know, you were sort of pretending that you were fine with his predilections and, you know, how could you be of assistance to him with it? And you were trying to learn about his methods and you did learn. So the part of the grooming, as I understood it from the film was he wanted you to make sure like you in grooming kids for him, you talked about inappropriate sexual things in front of them. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first, he was always wanting to make sure I dressed accordingly, which I never did. I let him know. He wanted to know what kind of bathing suits I have. Do I have a really tiny bikini? And to prance around around the children when, they, when they're over and to pick out who I think would be best and their siblings. So my, my children's friends and their, their siblings, the younger, the better. And Jared, initially, his statement to me was um, how hot he thought middle school girls were. At the end, it went from there all the way to infants to prepubescent. Oh, and there, you have him on tape the saying the younger the better. Wrestling well, you'll hear in that bed, with your own ears. Tickling, Sorry, go ahead. tickling Sorry, and wrestling and gradually getting closer to the private parts and then doing like a daring. to So it turned it into a game. Um, he used his popularity, his, um, you know, himself being famous because there was such an allure and, and the children were so drawn, they get to meet someone famous. And I saw that mm. all the time. But the, he, he says in one of the clips about um, the, the one from the broken home. He was always, he, he had it figured out. And he what did. he didn't, he would go with it and keep it as, something that he just studied children on how to get closer and closer. And, and that's what his focus was. That was so disturbing. So mm -hmm. now moms or single dads who are raising kids by themselves now have to worry about their kids being singled out for targeting by a pedophile because they're from a quote, broken home, because they may mm -hmm. have an extra sadness in their lives that some sick, twisted effer will take advantage. I mean, that's these are the realities mm -hmm. that we have to wrestle with. And as exposed by your reporting and this story, um, but the inappropriate sex talk at a young age, it is relevant, Rochelle. I mean, you know, we're debating this right now on a national level about these books that are coming into the K through 12 education system. And some say, oh, they're banning books, you know, and I think the truth is they're not banning. They're pulling books out of children's school libraries that are not age appropriate. And this is mm -hmm. people defending that action of pulling the books will say it, they're groomers, the people who want this in front of the children. And I see the point. Inappropriate sex talk before in front of children isn't just improper. It can actually lead to very dangerous things in that child's future. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that's just any, any, you know, base level psychologist counselor will tell you that. I mean, a lot of us don't have a degree in, in, um, mental health, but a lot of it is common sense. And that has been removed too many times over. Uh, it's, it's interesting when you see what they do allow in and, but they are taking, taking some measures to remove this, but is it too far, you know, too, too little, too late? I don't know. Now, if you look statistically speaking um, over the years, homeschooling has grown dramatically as a personal choice. Um, there's a number of reasons that people have made this choice. But from my understanding, a lot of it because it has to do with, you know, you see not just men, but women also violating children. Um, your educators, clergy, group leaders, uh, politicians, even law enforcement. Um, I know that there's a, just a small amount, but small is not none. And that's where we need to get. Mm, right. So these moms are like, I'm not putting my kid in the school and my kid's not joining mm -hmm. the Boy Scouts and isn't going to be an altar boy. I mean, I can relate to some of that to some extent. It's just mm -hmm. you're, you're so, especially when they're really little and they can't really vocalize and they could be taken advantage of. You have to be so careful. So mm -hmm. I, like, do we know about Jared, how he got this way, Rochelle? Is, has anybody been able to interview him or, you know, did you ever ask him, like, was he molested? He, I did ask him. He said, no, he was not. But I think that a lot of people, if they were, I don't think they're just going to come out and say that, even if he was comfortable with me, that if he was, perhaps that um, that just hit too too close to home. Um, I can understand that, but I think personally that it's just within his his genetic makeup. I think that there's a default in um, how he's wired. I think that's just I, whether it's an illness. I kind of think that it is. Um, I would hope that it is in the sense that you know, hopefully we can find a fix for it later or at some point, but he doesn't even acknowledge that there's a problem. And you asked me, you said about anyone interviewing him in this docu-series, I gave the, the producers and directors the idea. I said, well, why don't we close the docu-series with a face-off between Jared and I at the facility um, that he's in, because I would like some closure. I would like to say a few things to him. Um, but he, they did send the request and, and he, you know, he declined. Um, but that is something that I would have been interested in doing because, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing easier than gauging somebody by their body language. Mm. Do you, does he have any ongoing relationship with his parents? Do you know what that situation is? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think, I believe his mom was a teacher, his father's a doctor, um, probably retired now, but from all information that has been dispersed out there is he had a very good upbringing. Um, you know, prominent family, uh, really no money issues. So they didn't have, have that aspect. So I don't know why Jared has done what he's done, but I have heard um, and this is secondhand, so there, but people that went to school with Jared, um, college, for example, he, he would, I was told that he would sell, um, pornography to make some extra money. Um, mm. and he made quite a bit of doing that. So they also perhaps, talked about how yes. he was morbidly obese from mm -hmm. a young age that he had no friends in high school you know, there's a reason he got famous for losing 245 pounds. He had it to lose and then some had, you know, enough left over. It's like 245 mm -hmm. pounds. What's left? A large man. So he was very, very large. And I do think there's, when you're that kind of an eater from a young age, there's an issue. There's an issue there. Mm -hmm. I don't know what went on in that family. Um, but, you know, you see your kid is, what, 350, 400 pounds and has absolutely no friends. That's That's not a good parent. That is not a good set of yeah. parents. Something something was wrong in that house. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So a couple questions for you as now sure. we're thinking about his release. 
Is it, do we know if there's any chance he's getting out earlier than 2029? No, he cannot. He is not allowed okay. to get out earlier according to um, the stipulations the judge had set down. Is there any chance he could face other charges? You know, I know I've seen you reaching out saying, if, mm-hmm. if you are a victim of Jared Vogel's, reach out to mm-hmm. me because there may be children who have been molested by him who haven't yet come forward. Absolutely. In my mind and from my experience, that is an actual fact. There are. They're adults now. Perhaps they're just trying to, you know, keep it in the shadows, in the recesses of their mind. That is not healthy. You will not be all you can be and you won't have a truly fulfilling life unless you address what had happened. And the fact is, is that it did happen. And if you come out and you step forward, you know, I could be and give you my shoulders, my strength, my voice um, to help to be able to disseminate and, and set this in the, into the, the areas. I know the FBI has a great um, place that you can go on their website and report things. Um, but if, if anyone is hearing this and they are a victim of Jared Fogel's, please, I, I really, I really must insist that you please step forward and share what happened because it can make a difference. It can keep him behind bars where he needs to be because the day he is released is the day society is going to be in grave danger. And I truly mm-hmm. believe that. Mm-hmm. Me too. So you're, what are you doing now? Are you still doing radio and, and journalism? It seems like some of your work has shifted to advocacy on behalf of kids now and writing books to help yes. sound the alarm for families. Yes. Um, I had stepped away. Um, the FBI had asked me or told me two years ago, I had to leave my business and um, eliminate all my original contact information so that because uh, Jared had that same contact information. So all of that had to go away um, when Jared was arrested because they actually it was before when before Jared was arrested was when I ended my work with the FBI. Um, so everything had to end. And so I went off into a different arena um, for for a while. And then I had fallen ill um, for, for quite a while and was bedridden for about three years. But what? Yes. Yes, I, oh. I um, slipped at, at um, a, a, you know, a job that I was doing. I was team leader for Keller Williams in Sarasota, and I had slipped, broke my ankle, and I came down with RSD, which is um, now it's um, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, it's AKA the suicide disease, the world's most painful chronic condition. Um, I've learned to disseminate the pain, and, and that's another book that I'm working on, actually, on how to teach people how to do what I've done um, because I still have it to this day. Um, But what I am now doing, and I am going to start doing podcasts and get back on, on um, terrestrial radio again, because MTV, if possible, that's really where I, I did my best work and where I would like to be. Um, uh, Since this docuseries um, under contract. So it's one year from the date of airing before I can do any of that. But in the meanwhile, I am writing, I have um, three, three books pertaining to um, child advocacy for, for child sexual abuse that goes from, um, it goes, one, about the story, you know, uh, you know, in the mind, the mind of a monster. And that's going to be all these other areas that I haven't been able to share because there's just not enough time. So I'm going to be, that's all in that book. Um, and you know, all the behind the scenes and, you know, everything that happened during the, my time with the FBI. But then the other, another book that I'm writing is for children. Um, and it's going to be, a, it is actually, cause I'm about halfway through, but it's about, it's a workbook on how to strategically position themselves to be their own superhero and, you know, with between knowing the signs of a predator and what good play and bad play is, um, I actually am going to be putting it on my site, just the outline of 
where I'm at and and exactly what is happening with my writing so that I because I'm still in the process so I would love feedback from the public so I will share some of that so that it can be written yeah. into the best possible workbook out there that I'm hoping at some point not just for personal use but that can also be implemented in um, in school criteria as well and then another one is for caregivers and parents to know the warning signs because when someone is being abused whether it's the elderly um, or they're manipulated or a child they're very silent uh, you don't recognize what's really going on um, in most cases a lot of times you do you just see something that's off but it's like asking the right questions looking for certain markers are they uncomfortable um, when this particular person is approached do they do they fight when you say oh you get to stay over their house tonight uh, there's there's a lot um, that I think that can be very helpful and and there's a lot of elderly that are not only abused by personal caregivers in their home but in facilities as well trusted employees yeah. that yeah. you know the people are putting hidden cameras in the rooms because they sent something as off mm. well uh, this is all great work i mean this clearly is your life's work this is going to make a difference in people's lives i i do have to ask you you know now with him in jail with the story out there any regrets like if you had it to do over again would you Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. That there's other cases that I'm working on. As a matter of fact, they're not child sexual abuse cases. Um, they're they're very diverse in nature, um, but there are other cases that have presented themselves to me. I'm all in, and you know, law enforcement has always been, um, you know, open arms with me, and I am so happy that I am received that way because. When I came out after Jared was initially arrested, I felt as though, wow, you know, a whistleblower that, you know, they're going to want to keep me at arm's length. They're going to think less of me. And years pass, and I have come to find out because they've told me themselves, absolutely not, that they greatly respect the work that I did. And, you know, and I still continue my work today. Hmm. I'm so glad to hear that. And I'm so glad to meet you. Rochelle, thank you for telling your story and for all that you've done. Oh, I appreciate you, Megan, very much. And I want to thank you and all your listeners for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. Mm. All the best to you and your family. Thank you. Isn't she amazing? This is the story. Oh, my God. Tomorrow, we have an equally fascinating discussion on cults. We've got the personal story. Uh, from two guests of what it's like to be in a cult and to get out of one. You will not want to miss this. We'll see you then. <laughs>